Good morning. A new year brings a new administration and a shakeup to the White House. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with me. Merry Christmas. I'm Maria Bartiromo. This is Sunday Morning Futures. President-elect Donald Trump putting the final touches on his administration. With just a few weeks until the inauguration, what can we expect in 2017? I'll ask former House Speaker Newt Gingrich in just a few moments. Plus, what is next for the Democratic Party after Hillary Clinton's election night defeat? and a failure to gain a majority in the Senate. A former spokesperson for the Clinton campaign will join me. And what will changes to tax rates and regulations do to the economy under the president-elect? I'll sit down with the picks for Treasury and Commerce Secretaries Stephen Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures right now. President-elect Donald Trump's victory on election night, turning the nation's political landscape upside down, marking a victory for the millions of Americans angry with the political establishment. So what can we make of Mr. Trump's incoming administration so far, and what does 2017 hold for him and the country? Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich is the author of Treason. He is a Fox News contributor, and it is good to see you again, Mr. Speaker. Thanks so much for joining us. No, it's good to be with you, and it's a very exciting time to watch the development of the new Trump administration. It really is. It's been fascinating to see the picks that he has chosen uh, in terms of some key roles. Let's let's talk about 2017, what it looks like. We are now less than uh, a month away from the inauguration. What do you expect to happen once President Trump takes office? Well, first of all, I think the opening couple of days, he's going to repeal 60 or 70 percent of Obama's legacy by simply vetoing out all of the various executive orders that Obama's used uh, because he couldn't get anything through Congress. I think, second, we're, Republicans will be a little surprised. I think that President-elect Trump is going to reach out to Democrats and try to form a Trump majority in the House and Senate on things like infrastructure, on health reform, to see whether or not we could break out of the gridlock of the past. And I think he'll have the active support of both uh, Speaker Ryan and Senate Majority Leader McConnell to reach out and see in the Senate if we could get oh, seven or eight Democrats hanging out with us, uh, we would really be in good shape. In the House, they don't need them as much because of the difference in the rules. But uh, Speaker Ryan has always felt that bipartisan achievements last longer, they're better, they're harder to work out. You have to think them through more. If you look at the mental health bill which just passed, uh, which is a huge bill, and the uh, 21st Century Cures bill, which had enormous impact on the National Institute of Health and the Food and Drug Administration, these were both very bipartisan. I think uh, only a handful of people voted against them. And that's because the homework had been done on a nonpartisan basis to get a really good bill. Well, take infrastructure. There ought to be a way for Democrats and Republicans to come together to try to make America's railroads and America's highways and America's water systems dramatically better. You look at Flint, Michigan, uh, over a 100-year-old water system, genuinely hurting the health of people. There ought to be a way to come together and do that. There are a number of other issues where I think uh, President-elect Trump will find, turn out to be an American president, not just a Republican president, and that will be very conscious. I hope he's going to meet in the very near future with the Black Caucus, with the Hispanic Caucus, and really extend... Uh, an invitation to them to come to the White House to sit down together and to find ways to help people who genuinely need help. He's also made a promise to uh, begin tax reform first 90 days in office. That's what Steven Mnuchin has said. That's what Donald Trump has said. Will he keep that promise? Well, I think you've got a huge advantage in that uh, Chairman Brady of the Ways and Means Committee and Speaker Ryan worked together when Ryan was head of Ways and Means, and that's where the bill will originate. And they have very strong, very clear ideas that are very compatible with Trump. And I'm sure that Mnuchin is sitting down with them right now trying to work out a, a really powerful, strong bill. Remember, the num one of the great challenges for President-elect Trump is to take the Trump rally on stock market and turn it into a Trump reality in the economy. And that means things like passing a very powerful, very dynamic tax bill that liberates American business and starts creating a lot more jobs here at home. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's what this market has been rallying on. Now, then there's the repeal and replace of Obamacare, and then they're securing the borders. Will they keep the promises? 
Oh, I think overall, he uh, look, we're going to repeal Obamacare, but we're going to keep key things that people really like. For example, the ability to make sure uh, that you can retain your health insurance when you, once you're in the system, no matter what your precondition might be. The ability to stay in your parents' insurance until you're 26, although I think uh, the, the president-elect wants to have an economy so robust and so exciting that, you know, we're at a 75-year high of young people staying and living with their parents. And not in 75 years have we seen this many young people who can't find jobs. I mean, let's be clear. The number one reason they're staying with their parents is they don't, they're not earning enough to move out. Right. Uh, and I think, uh, with all fairness, uh, having two grown daughters, I can say, you do, you do get to a point where your parents would like you to you know, be able to have your own place. Uh, so it's uh, a two-way street it. there. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think Trump, Trump will make both the kids and the parents happy if he can get that economy moving. Yeah, you're not kidding there. All right, in terms of challenges, Newt, what do you see as the challenge for Donald Trump? I recognize he's got both chambers with the Republican majority, which is good. He can get a lot done in that regard. But what will be his challenges for 2017? I think he's got three immediate big challenges. The first is just the nature of the world. Every morning he's going to get up with very important things in mind, and lots of little things are going to come piling on. And he's going to have to learn to pass out and ignore the little things, give them to cabinet officers, give them to staff, and stay focused on the big things. Reagan did it the best of anybody I've seen uh, in my lifetime, and I think that Trump has to have that. If he's going to get stuff done, he has to come back with real focus on the big things. Second, I think he's going to discover that the... Um, uh, the whole process, the bureaucracy, uh, the red tape, uh, the degree to which uh, the government employee unions stop you from doing things, all these guys who run these big companies are going to suddenly find out they're, in a, they have, they're surrounded by all this red tape. Cutting through that, getting civil service reform, getting control of these big bureaucracies will be an enormous challenge. Nobody's done it in my lifetime, and I think this is a cabinet that could do it, but they've got to stay focused on that. And third, I think... You're going to have a permanent opposition, sort of a combination of the news media and the Elizabeth Warren hard left. Uh, and they're going to attack every single day. Uh, and they're going to find something to attack all the time. And they've just got to get used, Trump's got to get used to the idea that that's okay, that's just noise. His job is to produce for the American people. And frankly, to the degree that the Democrats decay into being just the anti-Trump party, mm. they will keep themselves in the minority for a long time. Yeah, they make a lot of good points. Well, that attack from the sharp left uh, is probably one of the reasons he got elected. I mean, there's this pull going on, and now they're talking about Keith Ellison not listening to voters still on the Dem side. We're going to speak with Karen Finney about that coming up. Uh, Newt, it's been such an incredible pleasure and an honor to talk with you this year on, on such an unbelievable year. What's your big takeaway from 2016? That America is still an unbelievable country and that the American people are still in control of their destiny. And they didn't do what they were told to do. They didn't do what the media thought they would do. Uh, they created history on their own, despite all the elites. Uh, that was what makes America the most unique country in the world for individual liberty. I like it. Mr. Speaker, good to see you. Thanks so much. Take care. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you, Newt Gingrich. What is next now for Hillary Clinton, meanwhile, and who will emerge as the leader of the Democratic Party? I'll be speaking with the former Clinton campaign spokesperson on that next. Then more on Donald Trump's economic plan with Treasury Secretary nominee Steve Mnuchin and Commerce Secretary nominee Wilbur Ross. Follow me on Twitter at Maria Bartiromo at Sunday Futures. Let us know what you'd like to hear from our guest lineup today. Stay with us as we look ahead right now on Sunday Morning Futures. Newly released court documents show that the FBI seized and searched the computer of top Hillary Clinton aide Huma Abedin, owned by her estranged husband, Anthony Weiner. That to continue the email investigation into the Democratic presidential nominee. Now, the FBI discovered Abedin and Clinton were emailing one another, but what exactly the messages were about was unclear at the time. This further angering Democrats who feel the reopening of the FBI investigation into Clinton's emails a few weeks before the election hurt her chances to win against President-elect Donald Trump. Karen Finney is a former spokesperson for the Clinton campaign. She is also uh, a, the a former Democratic National Committee spokesperson. Good to see you, Karen. Thanks so much for joining us. 
Great to be with you, Maria. So first let me ask you about these unsealed search warrant in Hillary Clinton's mm -hmm. email probe and what it reveals. Uh, what is your reaction? <laughs> Well, I think they revealed what we said all along. I mean, it shows that there was incredibly flimsy information uh, that uh, Director Comey was going on. And, you know, at the time there were reports that part of the reason Director Comey made the announcement that he did 10 days out from the election is that he was afraid of the possibility of leaks coming out of his New York office. Uh, so he went ahead and made this announcement. And as we said then, and as we discovered 10 days later, there really was no there there. Uh, these were duplicate emails. There was no new information. But I think it's very troubling what that says about Director Comey and his ability to run the FBI. Well, let me ask you about that, because, I mean, maybe could it be that it was just the fact that it was on, her emails were on Anthony Weiner's computer that unnerved Comey? Basically, more carelessness to have well, national secrets or important emails on Anthony Weiner's computer when we know he was sexting yeah. and doing all sorts of uh, well, whatever he was doing. Right. Well, look, here's the thing I would say about that. What concerns, uh, I think, a lot of people, and I think still is an open question, is that Director Comey made a decision to do something that was unprecedented and sort of without um, actual, uh, you know, previous uh, precedent, I guess is the way to say it. And what's interesting about that is consider that when we were talking about Russian hacking, there were uh, 17 of our intelligence agencies had just about a month or so earlier agreed that it, uh, among the intelligence that there was evidence that the Russians had been hacking. And that's when DNI and Homeland Security came out and, and made a statement. And F the FBI, uh, Director Comey, didn't want to join that statement because he thought it would be too political. And so for him to then break with precedent and break with sort of the norms of the FBI 10 days before an election uh, to do something that was clearly very political, I think is troubling. And look, here's the thing, though, Maria, that I think is so important. I mean, at this point, you know, the election is over. The results are in. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is our president-elect. But I do think there are questions raised going forward about the FBI that are legitimate and I think are things we need to look into. And I can just tell you from having been on the ground that there was absolutely a chilling effect in terms of the momentum from being in some of the same states, some of those key states, uh, just a few days before that letter came out to a few days after that letter came right. out. Let me move on, Karen, because there's a lot of debate about where the party goes now. And I know that uh, voters recently voted back in Nancy Pelosi. You've got Elizabeth Warren pulling uh, the, from, the, from the left, uh, the center. Uh, you've got Bernie Sanders and his very leftist policies pulling the party toward the left from the center. Same with Barack Obama. Do you think that's what the people want? I mean, based on what we just saw in this election, do you think that voters want to see the Democratic Party all the way to the left, the way that these folks well, are pulling the party? Well, I take a different view, and what I see in terms of the leadership here in Washington is kind of an array, frankly, of voices and faces. Don't forget there's Joe Manchin. Don't forget Mark Warner of Virginia. And there are, so I think that is actually a good thing to say, let's open this up and hear from more parts of our party. I, look, I also think, Maria, let's be very clear about what the results of the election really told us. I mean, Hillary Clinton has 2.8 million more votes in the popular vote than Donald Trump. So my question is, well, what about those people? We know that some three million pe or more people voted uh, for third party candidates. What about those people? So when we talk about what did Americans want, I think we need to look at the full picture. And I think when we look at that full picture, I think the issue here is making sure that we hold Donald Trump accountable to the promises that he made to the American people. Because I think what people wanted, it wasn't just about anti-establishment, although I think that was a very clear headwind, no question. Mm. At the same time, people wanted to be heard. It was about jobs. It was about protecting Medicare and Social Security. And and, you know, infrastructure, building, right. you know, creating well, that, more. But that's my so point. all of those things, but yeah. this is my point. So my point is, 
All of those things are things that Democrats have been also talking about for a very long time. President Obama tried to get many of those things done. He was, you know, rebuked, rebuked frankly, at, um, at every turn by Republicans who basically said anything from Obama is going to be a negative. Well, so he had, the first, two, now he had can... the first two years of his administration. He had both chambers. He could have gotten anything done the first two years, well, and he chose not to push that's through not exactly. That's not exactly how, how, how it works. But, I mean, and again, if the Republicans had been interested, though, at the time in getting infrastructure done, we could have gotten that done. So my point here is I think what you're seeing inside Washington is an attempt to try to broaden out sort of who are the leaders or who are the of, of the party. But, look, I think there's a bigger challenge for the party going forward, and that is we need to much be much more broad in the voices and faces of our party. Uh, you know, we have people in our party from from all walks of life, from all parts of this country, right. uh, from, you know, people who serve in the military, people who, you know, you know, uh, work, uh, you know, in restaurants, people who are small business owners, people, you know, so people in all uh, facets of life. And I think what we need to do is represent those folks. And I think part of the, pro the issue here is we need to have a stronger presence out in the states, have a real 50-state strategy like we had under that, uh, pres I'm sorry, uh, Chairman Howard Dean was trying to bring to fruition, which was to really make sure that we showed up everywhere and asked people for their votes, but that we were engaged in communities around the country all throughout the year, not just a few days before the election, and that we were really strengthening and building on the talent that exists in our party in the states and and where people really live and really listening to people at that level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think when you look back at the election, that's what it was all about. You had a lot of people on the left talking about uh, transgender bathrooms and and uh, police brutality and climate change, and you had well, Donald Trump's team talking about jobs. That that was well, that I was the big missed opportunity. Although I, I take issue with that, I mean, you know, there have been a couple of studies that uh, showed actually that Hillary Clinton talked about jobs more than anything else. And what I would tell you is that, you know, some of the coverage did not always reflect that. I mean, there was a lot more coverage about other topics than necessarily her jobs plan or her plans to bring back manufacturing or her plans to revitalize, uh, uh, you know, not just urban areas, but rural areas. Um, and looking at, you know, sort of how do we make sure that we increase incomes for people. I mean, so there was a lot that we were talking about that she was talking about that didn't always get the same kind of coverage as, let's say, emails. And I think what's so important here... She should have done here, more press conferences, she should have done more interviews, and you should have done more debates. Well, I mean, I, look, I think we would have loved to do more debates, but again, I mean, there's an element to, you know, what gets covered, uh, I, I think, certainly does impact what, what people hear. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the other telling things of this election. It yeah. felt like, to some degree, there was a conversation that was going on in the national media sure. that I think what we know now from sort of Facebook yep. and sort of fake news and the alt-right and all of that, yes. there was a whole other conversation going on that I think we need to understand better. Right. Karen, great to see you. Thank you so much. We'll be watching Karen Finney joining us there, and we'll be right back. Preparing to take the helm at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But many of his critics are still questioning his ties to his own organization. Has he done enough to separate himself from his businesses? And is there any cause for concern? Judge Michael Mukasey is with me. He is a former attorney general under President George W. Bush. And, Judge, it is always an honor to talk with you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. What do you think about this? It seems to me that this is an area that Donald Trump really has to get right. And there could be some blind spots around. Do you think he's done enough to separate himself from his business I I don't think we can tell because he hasn't really gotten up and described what it is that he intends to do uh, to separate himself from his businesses and um, and it's potentially a problem in part because there are no laws um, that apply here now in a way that creates a lot of freedom but it also creates a lot of freedom for critics who can simply get up and say you know this creates an appearance problem and not have to define any particular law to which it relates right. um, and there that's is what's going on right now and that's what's going on yeah. right now right um, there is a clause in the Constitution that says that um, a president is not allowed to receive uh, among other things emoluments from foreign governments um, w that's never been delved into or, or applied as far as I know. It didn't have to be dealt with. Correct. Right? Because we've never had a situation it's like totally this. totally different. Right. 
And um, so the question is, if, if, if a foreign government buys something and pays the same thing that everybody else pays for it, like, for example, space at a Trump hotel, um, and any of that proceeds goes to him, is that an emolument? I don't know that it is. Is it? I mean, in past presidential situations, they would just put their money and their assets in a blind trust. Here, he can't do that. He's got his kids running the business. Is it enough for him to say, my sons will run the business, we're not going to have discussions about what's going on in the business? I don't know that it is. And... Um, the part of because part of it relates to where the money in the business goes, and obviously he's going to go back to the business. So to the extent that they're creating um, an interest for him to go back to, that there are questions about that. In addition to which, um, if people are are doing things and or, or doing business with those those companies in the hope of getting access to the family and to him, um, that also creates. The appearance. appearance, the that, appearance problem. That, and you don't want that appearance. Right. I, I, he said that he's going to have a press conference early January to tell us about this. So let's just say more to come on that subject. I right. want to switch gears to ask you about the executive orders. I think part of the uh, repudiation uh, that, that voters felt in this election was uh, uh, no more executive orders to President Obama. Now, President-elect Trump has said as soon as he gets into office, he's going to start using his pen to re reverse some of those. What are you expecting on day one and two? Um, I'm expecting that there will be a list of executive orders. I'm sure there are people who are working on that, even as you and I are talking, um, to draw up a list of executive orders that ought to be repealed and ought to be repealed on day one. They, in, they may include things like, for example, the order closing Guantanamo. Um, I would expect that would be an early candidate. Um, they may include things like an order saying that we're going to limit um, interrogations to the Army fuel manual other things of that sort. Mm. Let's um, talk about the Guantanamo Bay uh, one okay. for a moment, because was it day one that President Obama signed in, in an executive order, I will close Guantanamo Bay? Actually, it was day two. Day two, okay. Day two, and there was this wonderful ceremony. He signed three or four of these relating to um, prisoner treatment and to, uh, and to Guantanamo. And I can, I can remember the, the scene when he signed the one relating to Guantanamo, because he read it out, sort of staggered through it, frankly, uh, by the power vested in me, consistent with the, the national security interests of the United States, he, closing Guantanamo, he signed it with a great flourish, and then he said, uh, and you, I think you can still watch this on YouTube. It's on YouTube right now. Yes. Okay. He said, um, Greg, which was a reference to Greg Craig, who was then White House counsel, is there another order here saying what we're going to do with these people? which meant that he hadn't even thought through something that was the centerpiece or a centerpiece of his campaign. He didn't have a plan. None. No wonder they all went back to the fight. Nobody had thought it through. Nobody had thought it through beyond signing the order. And the voice off camera belonging to the White House counsel, Greg Craig, said, well, we're going to have procedures. And he then looked very earnestly into the camera and said, yeah, we're going to have procedures. Even as we sit here today, Judge, President Obama is trying to get as many people out of as Guantanamo as possible. He wants to do everything he can to make it hard for Donald Trump to reverse it. Correct. And um, to increase um, the per capita cost and claim that it's, it's, it's wildly expensive. Of course, the, the easy way to drive down the per capita cost is to have more capitas there. That is, more people. Right. To send more people there. So, right. you think, so you think Guantanamo Bay is one of the first ones that Donald Trump Probably. Will yeah. Probably. It sh I think it should be. I mean, I, I don't know that, but I think it should be an early candidate. Really interesting stuff. Judge, good to see you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Michael Mukasey there. Jobs, taxes, regulations. Up next, my interview with Treasury Secretary nominee Stephen Mnuchin and Commerce Secretary nominee Wilbur Ross. What they plan to do in the first 90 days and beyond. We're looking ahead today on Sunday Morning Futures. Welcome back. Creating jobs, rolling back regulations, cutting taxes. These are some of the priorities for President-elect Trump's economic team on Mornings with Maria on the Fox Business Network. I sat down with Treasury Secretary nominee Stephen Mnuchin and Commerce Secretary nominee Wilbur Ross, who told me tax reform will be priority number one with the first 90 days in office. We're going to have an integrated plan and, and work closely between Commerce and Treasury to make sure that we drive growth in this country. Our number one priority is sustained 3 to 4 percent GDP. 
Three to four percent GDP is almost double what we're seeing right now. And of course, how do you get there is the question in terms of growth. When would you expect three to four economic growth? You know, I think this is something over the next couple of years we're going to get to, and I think it's very achievable. I mean, this has been an administration for the last eight years where we haven't had enough growth. Our number one priority is going to be tax reform. We think that by lowering the corporate tax rate, we're going to make U.S. corporations incredibly competitive and create enormous amounts of money that comes back on shore and creates jobs. Wilbur, let me, let me ask you about steel tariffs that you've dealt with in your private life and running your business and the idea that people are worried about potential tariffs actually being a disruptor for economic growth. How do you see tariffs and trade changing? Well, trade is the important thing to change and tariffs are one potential ultimate tool. But really they're for the most part a negotiating tool to get the countries to relieve the tariff and non-tariff barriers to our trade. The real objective is to build our exports, not so much to kill the imports. That's a total mischaracterization of what's being done. Now, if need be, there will be tariffs, and there'll be especially tariffs for punitive purposes for people who dump. Stephen, if it's one thing that you hear from managers of businesses and CEOs over and over again, it's the fact that our tax plan uh, is, is the most uh, unfavorable uh, in the industrialized world, the, the highest taxes in the industrialized world. Talk to us. You said in the first 90 days you're going to have tax reform. Walk us through it. Sure. So this is going to be a major priority, and there's two aspects of it. One, as I mentioned, is, is corporate taxes, and the other is personal income taxes. And we're going to simplify the personal income tax, lower from seven brackets down to three, simplify it, deliver a very significant middle income tax cut that's going to be combined with the child care program. And the other aspect of it is on the upper end, not, got, not will cut the tax rate, but it will be offset with a significant reduction of deductions. So for the upper class, it won't be a tax cut, but it will be a simplification. It will lower the marginal rate, which will spur investment. You, you say it will spur investment because you have to assume that with a better situation on earnings, because companies are paying less in tax, they will reinvest that money in their business. And higher. Yeah, absolutely. We, we fundamentally believe in dynamic scoring of taxes, and this is something we're going to be working with Congress and, and passing legislation. What regulations out there do you think are most onerous that you really do need to take a second and third look at? Well, the first thing we're going to do is look at Dodd-Frank, and it is way, way, way too complicated, and there's many aspects of it that we got to kill. There's, there's many aspects of it that prevent banks from lending, and we need to make sure that banks lend. We want to see huge growth in this economy. It's small and medium-sized businesses, and we need to make sure that the banks are lending to them. So the, the, the rules had become so stringent that the banks pulled back, and they, and they were lending less. Uh, Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the rules are so complicated that many times banks don't even know how to interpret many of the rules. So let me just say, you know, I, I believe in we need to have proper regulation of banks that have FDIC deposits to make sure that we keep the safety of FDIC deposits. But having said that, there's many, many aspects of Dodd-Frank that cross over so many things that make no sense that we're going to look at. Well, you probably experienced this as well, Will. Well, I did in the yeah. banks that we have. Yeah. The average small bank now has more compliance people than lending officers. That's a very flawed business model. And, and even at the large banks, the, the regulators have offices there, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's not the way to run a bank. Government is not the right way to allocate capital. Private sector is the right way. Look at Fannie and Freddie, the two things that government had the most influence on. They're not exactly role models. Would you move to change Fannie and Freddie at this point? Would you move to have these uh, privatized? Absolutely. we, we got to get Fannie and Freddie out of government ownership. It makes no sense that these are owned by the government and have been controlled by the government for as long as they have. In many cases, this displaces private lending in the mortgage markets. And we need these entities that will be safe. So let me just be clear. We'll make sure that when they're restructured, they're absolutely safe and they don't get taken over again. But we've got to get them out of government control. So tell me about NAFTA. What do you want to change about NAFTA? 
Well, I think the right way to negotiate NAFTA is in conference rooms with Mexico and Canada, not, frankly, in the press room. Yeah, okay. No, I, that's a fair point. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people worry, business in particular, that if we're going to see, you know, pulling out of TPP, looking at NAFTA, changing NAFTA, looking at anything else that may not make sense, is it too much at once? Will it create disruption as opposed well, to growth? Well, first of all, it isn't a question of pulling out of TPP. TPP right. does not exist. Right. It's a fiction of people's imagination at this point. Well, Obama wanted it to, to push it until the last days in office. Well, Come on. it was especially a figment of his imagination. <laughs> right. Um, so th that's the question, though, in terms of disruption, too much at once. What do no, you say no, to that? No, no, but my point is it's hard to say there's disruption when you don't do something you weren't doing anyway. What about NAFTA? That's NAFTA needs to be fixed, but it's not going to be fixed with blowing up the whole world. Mexico's not going to go to zero. Canada's certainly not going to go to zero. But there are changes needed, and I think the markets are recognizing it. Look how the peso has acted. If that doesn't tell you that everybody knows there'll be change, I don't know what does. My thanks to Wilbur Ross and Stephen Mnuchin. Up next, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy on immigration and repealing Obamacare. We're looking ahead to 2017 this morning on Sunday Morning Futures. More now on some key economic issues ahead in the new Trump administration. I'm with House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Congressman, you said you are going to be all about jobs. Tax reform is a priority. Repealing and replacing Obamacare is a priority, and border security is a priority. How do these things lead to jobs? Walk us through what your priorities are for 17, and when do you think you could actually get these things done? Well, I think all these are going to have to start right away. That's why I set the calendar for Congress. We made sure within those first 100 days we're working and in session more. That's excellent. Um, and we, we add weeks that we're working in there. We... Um, look at not just 100 days, but the first year. And we want to be working closely with this administration, this Senate as well, so we've been meeting on a weekly basis. There's certain things we can do right away and certain things we have to start and make sure we get it right. Um, one, when it comes to border security, you've got to make sure your country is safe. So President-elect Donald Trump has run on making sure this border is secure. You'll see an early bill with that. Regulations that we can deal with early on, looking at rolling them back and others. We'll see, we'll start moving those. Article 1, when I talked about um, the RAINS Act and the Midnight, and this Midnight Rules, sue and settle. Then you look at Obamacare. It has failed and everybody knows it. So what are we looking at a different place? We have to repeal it first and then we're going to replace it with new legislation where you get greater choice, more doctor-patient relationship, a health care system that actually works, that the, the premiums go down, greater choice. Uh, Not well, an easy thing to all do. All those insurance companies, I mean, United, you know, Universal, they, they, they said they were going to lose a billion dollars on it. Uh, they, they pulled out. Do you think that you're going to be able to work in terms of the insurance companies offering health care? Oh, yeah. You, you want to have... You want to have individuals have greater choice, more options out there to pick from. And I've already sent a letter to every governor and every insurance commissioner, give us your ideas as well. So it's not just the House or Senate involved in this, we want everybody's input in this, because we want to get this right. Explain sanctuary cities to me, because I, I don't understand why or how it's possible that for all of these years, we've been blowing off the law. I mean, what are you going to do with mayors like Rahm Emanuel, who say, look, if you're illegal, you're safe in Chicago? No. America is strong because of the rule of law. And if you break the rule of law, you break down society. Two years ago, we passed a bill. If you want to ignore and only pick and choose which law you want to enforce, then you should not be recipients of federal money. I think the sanctuary city issue is going to, wet, going to go away. These mayors are going to realize they can't pick and choose what federal law they want to enforce or not. So we need to protect the citizens there. Why would they want these individuals to come there illegally, not knowing who they are, and protect them? Their first role should protect America. So how first. far are you willing to go in terms of voting, in terms in terms of holding back uh, federal funding for these cities. Well, we have shown two years ago that if you want to pick and choose the law, and it's not just in sanctuary cities, we have to be a country that has a rule of law, a fairness. You can't pick and choose which ones they are. So you've got to uphold the laws that are passed. You've got a 
balance within to go through it. If you don't want that, then you shouldn't want the federal money to come with it. Wow. I think right. that's simple. There will be a lot of debates <laughs> in, in the new year. I can see that. Let's talk tax reform. Let me go back to that for a moment. We had Stephen Mnuchin on the show recently, incoming Treasury Secretary. Here's what he said about priorities in 17. Our number one priority is going to be tax reform. We think that by lowering the corporate tax rate, we're going to make U.S. corporations incredibly competitive and create enormous amounts of money that comes back onshore and creates jobs. Trump's plan is a 15 percent corporate tax rate. The, the GOP House plan was 20 percent. Where do you see this going? Well, we'll sit together and we'll work. We're the only way I see it going is that it's going to get lowered. If we want to create more jobs in America, we've got to create a structure that makes us competitive. Right now, we're not. Right now, our corporate tax rate is so high, it gives you an incentive to be in another country. We also, if we're in a world economy, you create money in another country, we punish you if you want to bring that back to invest in America. We're going to change all that. Keep America competitive where we can compete around the country. Create a tax system that's fair. There. Create a tax system that's simple. We have a tax plan that fits on a postcard so every family can fill it out themselves. But should we be pushing and warning companies that if you go overseas and then try to get your products back in, you'll get a 35 percent tariff? No, I think the way we solve competitiveness, we create a structure that makes you want to be in America. And I think lowering the tax rate dealing with repatriation so the money can come back to America, invest in America for American jobs, solves the problem that we're trying to go out, so you're out after. So you're not expecting to be warning the way President-elect Trump has done? I think what President-elect Trump is doing, he's warning others that America is not competitive today and that we're going to change all that. We're going to work very closely together to make sure we get a tax code that's fair and that works. And real quick on infrastructure, Congressman, are you going to be pushing back? Are you going to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure? I a trillion, a, conservative, a, a trillion dollars is very expensive. You know, I came into Congress, um, watched the President Obama do this stimulus, and at the end of the day, more people believed Elvis was still alive than the stimulus created a job. <laughs> but what you can do, currently today, the regulations to build a road, you wait a decade for that. You could see the reforms there. And what I like about President-elect Trump doing, he brings that business idea in. What, what about a private partnership? What about taking investments from the outside, changing the structure so you can build it faster, and looking at infrastructure in a different manner to make sure we build America stronger where we can be competitive? That's what I was going to say. As a conservative, you can't like uh, a trillion dollars in spending. You're, you're saying you could probably get there without spending that much money. Oh, no. You can make reforms where you can build something easier, faster, and cheaper. And you can take a, a reform where you allow private sector money in to make it happen as well. Congressman, you've got your works uh, set out for you. We're wishing you the best. Well, I'm telling you, we will not miss this window of opportunity. The America have put a trust in us. They want to see change, and we're going to make sure it happens. Congressman Kevin McCarthy joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Great me. Great to talk with you. So we'll be right back. Gather the nation and the world's attention, the biggest, has changed the political landscape in Washington. President-elect Donald Trump's surprise victory on November 8th over Hillary Clinton was voted the top story of the year in an associated press poll of editors and news directors. We bring in our panel right now. Ed Rollins is a former campaign manager for the Reagan-Bush ticket in 1984. Joe Trippi is a former campaign manager for Howard Dean and a Fox News contributor. Gentlemen, good to see you. And you. wow, what a year. It really has been an honor to sort of navigate things with you all year, Ed. Well, the truth of the matter is we would have sat here a year ago and said that uh, Donald Trump's going to be president and Hillary Clinton and her Democratic Party are going to be in kind of disarray. Uh, just the opposite story could have been told. I think most people thought Mrs. Clinton was going to be the nominee and the, and the president, and obviously the Democrats will do well in the House and the Senate. It just goes to show that campaigns matter and politics matter and candidates matter. And I think to a certain extent, Trump became this extraordinary candidate by the end who captured this last couple of weeks, this, this great unrest that's out there today and now he has to produce. You know, we were just talking with Karen Finney and she, she felt like it was the coverage of the media. I mean, wh wh why do you think all of that is? Well, you live, you live with the media. I mean, the truth of the matter, they're very much a part of a campaign, any campaign, whether it's your self-produced media. Uh, you, you, but you have to capture that that concern of the, the voters out there and, and Trump talked to that voter that's very unhappy. He sure did, Joe, because he, he made his campaign all about jobs. Uh, yeah, and he, I mean, and he also made it about Twitter. I mean, look, he, he what we saw was not just, uh, first of all, had Ed and I 
talked a year ago, we, we all would have agreed that if Trump had won, it would have been the biggest, uh, should be the biggest news of uh, 2016, and it is. But second of all, it's clear that the changing media environment and his understanding of social media and how to keep his, um, you, know, you know, what he wanted in, in front and in center and have the mainstream media all pick it up uh, was a bold stroke that worked for him. And I think we're going to see it uh, looking forward in his presidency for sure. Well, how much of it was, though, that she was a flawed candidate? I mean, do you think things would have been different had President Obama pushed somebody else forward or had the Democratic Party not been afraid to challenge Hillary? Uh, I, look, I look. I think when you lose by 78,000 votes, the three states that she lost, every single reason that everybody is putting out there, from hacking to Comey to their inability, Democratic inability to turn their vote out, every single one of them is going to be right. Every single reason is why she lost. But the fact of the matter is, she she did uh, win the popular vote. I'm not. He's president. Not taking that away from him. Right. Uh, but I'm saying that in the end, I think the party needs to take a deep look at what really did go wrong. Not, not, I mean, the Comey and the other things, are, and whether her server, those are all things that weren't in, the, in control. But did we get out the vote in the right places? Did we have a message uh, that appealed to, to blue-collar uh, workers in right. the Midwest? Uh, and, you know, and, and, I mean, clearly uh, we need to improve. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's a distraction to talk about the other stuff. Uh, even though I think as a country we should look into what happened with the Russians and make sure we understand it, um, I don't think as a party it does us any good to focus on that when we should focus on what, what did go wrong. Especially when you look at Wisconsin, right. Michigan, Ed. She didn't create any excitement. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I, she's obviously a woman who's served her country very ably and well, as for both as first ladies as a senator and secretary of state. She was the inevitable nominee, and she probably shouldn't have been. And at the end of the day, uh, she wasn't a very good general campaign, uh, and, and for a variety of reasons she got knocked off. But the integrity issue was her issue. She had built that up over a 30-year period. People didn't believe she was honest. Uh, and I think to a certain extent that's what did her in, in the end. What about the Republican Party, Ed? I mean, you know, let's face it. Donald Trump was not an establishment candidate by any means. Still, a lot of the still, GOP was against him. St still not an establishment right. candidate. It, it's now his party, and he has the Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate. They're not going to roll over and play dead for him, uh, particularly the Senate. But he has to lead them, and he has to basically put some wins on the board, uh, and he has to do some things that make Americans feel better about themselves, and he really has to drive this economy. If he drives this economy, if two years the economy is better in those states we talked about there, then obviously the Republicans will do well in the future. If not, we'll have failed and failed miserably. And, and it's also an experiment in terms of creating an environment for business uh, that they will hire, because the Dems will say that's actually not the way to grow an economy. Well, it's, it, I, I think we're going to have to rethink how we grow an economy, and I think the, the combination of ro robotics and and where we go there, we're not going to we're not going to get the big manufacturing jobs back in this country. They're not going to come back from China or Mexico or anywhere else. So you have to duplicate some other kind of job or create some new kind of job. That's going to be the test. Yeah, it's about skill sets. All right, we'll take a short break. Then when we come back, we're looking ahead. The one thing to watch in 2017 from our panel on Sunday Morning Futures next. Correct, and I think. Uh, look, we is we, uh, we sort of celebrate, you know, uh, getting to two thousand twenty thousand on the Dow is that is that's going to inevitably happen. Um, a lot of working people were left behind. They weren't part of that rally from ten thousand to twenty thousand, and 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 Obama and Democrats paid a price for that anxiety and watching the you know you know Wall Street move, but nothing else did in there in. in in those states we talked about, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Yeah. The question is, can, if that's what you're looking for. Does this administration, with uh, its business leaders, does it change that? Or does it look like, yeah. as everything keeps moving in the Wall Street, like they're still getting left behind. That's going to be what to look yeah. for in 2017. Can they do it real quick? I think they can. I think they've got a year to do it. Uh, they got to move a lot of stuff fast. All right. Ed Rollins, Thank Joe you. Trippi, good to see you both. That'll do it for Sunday Morning Futures. I'm Maria Bartiromo. From all of us, have a very Merry Christmas and a wonderful New Year. Media Buzz begins now.